For six days, we've seen a wave of far-right violence spreading across the UK. It began soon after the murder of three young girls. Over the weekend, it took an even darker turn, with arson attacks on hotels housing asylum seekers, mosques targeted and missiles thrown at police. Hundreds of people have been arrested, but as of Monday afternoon, it's not at all clear whether the rioting is over. It's a huge challenge for the new government, and parts of the mainstream right have been suggesting that widespread and justified unhappiness with immigration is the reason behind the violence. Some have even hinted that the violence itself is justified. Joining us in the studio now to get a better insight into what the hell's going on is Director of Research at Hope Not Hate, Joe Mulhall. Joe, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. We've all been shocked by the scale of the violence and hatred over the past few days. Why here and why now? So I think a lot of what we're seeing has been bubbling along for some time now. We've seen kind of really high levels of far-right activism across the country for some years now. You may remember there was a riot in Knowsley last year, and we saw six weeks of riots that emerged after that. And often what we see is a trigger event, if you will, which is a horrible way to phrase it, obviously, but that horrifying attack on Monday has been used as justification for what we've seen the following week. While it kind of started off with the very initial reaction to it, say, at the riots in Southport on Tuesday, that's spread out into a much more broader far-right set of grievances around multiculturalism, anti-Muslim prejudice, anti-asylum seeker prejudice. And so part of it is we've seen huge amounts of misinformation and disinformation online. We have seen far-right organising. But actually a lot of this anger is merging out of many, many years of uh, you know prejudice and discrimination that's coming out of way more mainstream places, mainstream politicians, the right to the Conservative Party, elements of our media. And that's being weaponised and directed by the far right in the recent days. Who are the people who are rioting? Is there a typical profile of a rioter? No. I mean, uh, kind of one of the things that's really interesting about what we're seeing here is that it's not a single organisation, right? It's not that there is a single organising group, a traditional fascist group you might think of, uh, you know, skinheads, braces, boots, etc. These events very much echo what the modern far right looks like in that it is a vast decentralized network of individuals in many cases thousands of individuals of different backgrounds different genders um, different ages that are plugged into these vast decentralized networks and then these events are kind of coming out semi-organically onto the street so while we are seeing involvement from traditional neo-nazi groups with swastika tattoos where you know this we, we can prove these things we are seeing people from fascist groups like Patriotic Alternative on the streets, there is a much broader demographic of individuals that have been involved, partly because the far right looks different to it did in, the, say, the 1970s. What are the networks they've been using? Is it Facebook? Is it TikTok? Is it um, uh, Twitter? Is it Or is it WhatsApp? What do they use? So, I mean, it's all of them, actually, unfortunately. I mean, these, we call them post-organisational networks, which are these essentially, are ostensibly like a school of fish. It's thousands of people. And the way that they operate around the internet is while they are individuals, they're not members of an organisation. They don't have a badge or they don't pay membership money. They're not regional leaders, etc. It's a huge network of individuals operating across many platforms simultaneously. And what you might call far-right influencers, direct this network around the internet and they use different platforms for different purposes so twitter has obviously been really important this week you know since elon musk much of the misinformation and disinformation that was targeted specifically at the muslim community for example was echoed and amplified by individuals that had previously been banned from twitter but had since been let back on by elon musk so twitter's been really important for this but then also we'll see local facebook groups emerging that out of these networks an individual will set one up and it'll just be a local group we've seen thousands Thousands of, say, people within the football hooligan world working within WhatsApp groups. We've seen people making YouTube videos. We've seen the most extreme elements of the movement in the kind of very traditional neo-Nazi scene. They use Telegram. So all of these things, and sometimes you'll see individuals using numerous platforms simultaneously. Others, it'll be uh, depending on your demographic or your region or, your, or the area of the movement in, you pick a specific network. How much have they been emboldened by Nigel Farage and reform? Are there overlaps in these networks? Uh, hugely. And um, I mean, it's hard to say I'm surprised by what Nigel Farage has done this week, obviously, after many years of watching him. But it was pretty extraordinary, the, the, the video that he put out where ostensibly he amplified far-right misinformation. He questioned the police narrative around what had happened. He asked whether or not this person was on a watch list. 
And I think it's worth, worth putting it in the context of this huge far-right demonstration we saw in London just a week ago when Tommy Robinson had 20 or possibly 30,000 people on the streets. The biggest cheer on that day in Trafalgar Square was when he asked if the people voted for reform. And numerous of the speakers from the stage that day said, are you listening, Nigel Farage? We are your constituency, etc." And it's very hard to look at that video by Nigel Farage uh, and not think that it's a nod and a wink to those people. It's a nod and a wink to the people out on the streets. Let's not forget, he's an MP now. If he wanted answers to these questions, as he phrased it, he could have asked them in the House of Commons. He could, there was all sorts of ways he could have got them, but he not. He chose to release social media content that amplified existing narratives. And of course, we've seen subsequently a range of reform figures and candidates and MPs excusing these riots as this kind of so-called legitimate concerns on the street. And we've heard the rioters chanting slogans, including stop the boats. Of course, Rishi Sunak's slogan. What does the fact that they're using one of a Conservative government's slogans tell us? So there's a few, few, few elements to this. One is, despite the fact that, as I say, there is no central organiser, that this is in many ways they're emerging out of these networks, there is a commonality we see between lots of these events. We're seeing the same chants. We're seeing stop the boats. We're seeing enough is enough. We're seeing Tommy Robinson chants. And again, that shows that while these events are ostensibly independently created, they are mixing within the same online spaces. But there's a reason that when this wave of misinformation and disinformation is pumped out by far-right influences, thousands of people have come out onto the streets and believed it. And the reason that those people believed this information about Muslims and that it's probably a Muslim is because of much more mainstream politics. It's because of the fact that we've had years of this kind of uh, seeding of prejudice and discrimination against asylum seekers and Muslims, whether or not that's people like Nigel Farage, whether or not that's elements of the right-wing media, or whether or not it's our Home Secretary standing in Parliament as Suella Braverman talking about invasion. Um, so much of what we're seeing on the streets here is reflecting this kind of bubbling anger and hatred that, yes, the far right, of course, are involved in directing, but actually a lot of it is emerging out of more mainstream places and it's too comforting to think of what we're seeing as this is like a the far right is a tumour that hangs off the body politic and if we just lop it off everything else is fine it's not it's an infection that lives within our politics and and the conservative party's radicalization over the last five years means that much of the radical right politics we look at in europe for example has been happening here that radicalization it poses the same threat to the liberal democratic politics of britain but it's happened ostensibly at the right of the Conservative Party, an ecosystem around the Conservative Party with GB News, elements of the right-wing media, and of course reform as well. Do you think Keir Starmer gets that? And if he does get it, is there anything he can actually do about it? Well, I think the one thing that the, the Labour Party absolutely have to do is, is not to see this as some legitimate outpouring of anger. Um, we have seen countless times European Social Democratic parties see a threat from the far right or the radical right and think that the way to deal with that threat is to shift right on issues of immigration, to get tough language, to get tough on immigration. Um, firstly, it just doesn't work. Uh, you know, Le Pen once famously said when she was talking about Chirac, they know the difference between the real thing and, and, and the faker. And that's very true. So it doesn't work. But it also shifts the centre ground right on issues where the Labour Party are less likely to be able to win. You're, they'll be playing on a pitch that people won't trust them on. The biggest thing that the Labour Party can do is take a moral position here, a standard, and and not turn around and say the best way to deal with this is to come out and say, we we understand, we we dislike immigrants as well. So far, the rhetoric from Keir Starmer has been very strong. I mean, one of the things we at Hope Not Hate were really concerned about is that people wouldn't call this far right, mm -hmm. that people would turn around and say, stop using the word far right, this is just normal uh, disgruntled people, despite the fact they chose to target mosques, Islamic centres, asylum seeker accommodation. Whether or not these individuals are part of an organisation that calls itself far right. They are engaging in far right activism and using far right rhetoric. And actually, it was nice to see Keir Starmer's statement yesterday where he came out and talked about far right violence. And he talked about making sure not only that the people committing this on the ground pay the price, but those individuals that are stoking it up as well are also going to be looked at. And so, so far, um, there's some positive signs. To try to look for some hope in all this hatred. Have you been heartened by the way that can, communities have come together to clean up and repair the damage the rioters have done? Yeah, of course. I mean, understandably, when these things happen, lots of local politicians and local, local people say, these people aren't from here. 
And I think that's quite a comforting thought. And actually, of course, the reality is when we look at where the arrests are coming from is that many of these people, unfortunately, are from these communities um, because these people are uh, engaging in this sort of politics all over the country. But it's absolutely right. I mean, it's been heartbreaking and, and you know, deeply, deeply moving to see people come together and say, no, this this is not what we stand for. These, this is not our form of politics, whether or not it was helping rebuild the the walls of a mosque in Southport, whether or not it was cleaning the streets in Sunderland, whether or not it's the thousands of messages that various people in the Muslim community and asylum seekers have been receiving. It is a reminder that this is a huge societal problem and I don't want to minimise it, but they remain a minority. And, and the, the positive thing about them being a minority is, is that we only lose this if we choose not to fight it. Um, we need to be careful because if we turn around and say that this is the so-called will of the people, um, then we, mainstream politicians will pander to it. And it, I think it's important to say it's widespread, but they may remain a minority. And, and I think some of the responses to this have been really heartening because they remind us of that. Joe, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. <laughs>